Hey everybody, how are you? It's good to see you here. Like honestly, I have been waiting for this webinar for a very long time. And webinar is not really a cool enough name for what I hope we get to do here in the next 45 minutes to an hour. Um, I'm Matt with K15T and if you didn't know, we're really big on sharing our information. Like crazy, crazy excited about helping people share our knowledge and information so that we can make our world a better place. That's just kind of like what we're all about. And so this webinar is all about sharing a little bit of that information with those product teams out there trying to manage information. Um, information has its own little life cycle, and it kind of doesn't mesh up necessarily with the product development life cycle. So we're going to talk about all of that. But first, a couple of clubhouse rules. First of all, jump in the chat. We're all here and we're all alive and it's, you know, maybe lunchtime for some of you. Well, you're probably like in the middle of the ocean if you're having lunch, but enjoy it. But definitely get in there, jump in the chat, chat with each other. If you have a question, use the Q&A button. I would hate to have the chat gobble up a question. That way I can see the question and Shannon and Stefan who are here helping today can also see it. I will try to answer them as quickly as I can because this is an interactive webinar. This is not a sit back and listen to Matt webinar. Please don't make us all go through that. So throw your questions in there. And then finally, get your fingers ready because we We'll be using a couple of interactive polls to make this webinar about you and your team because we wanna see what are the things that we are all struggling with? How can we learn together? Again, not just the Matt talking about stuff show. So get ready. We are going to have a great time. Um, thank you for the question already. All right, so I am, oh no, chat is disabled. Shannon and Stefan, can you help with that please? If not, thank you for letting us know, Christian. Appreciate it. All right, so let's start off by asking, have any of you experienced this, where you release the feature that <laughs> doesn't meet users' needs? Like, maybe you misunderstood the smallest little detail, and you deliver it six months later, and it just misses the mark. And 80% of your user base just, like, cannot use it. All right, we got chat going. Thank you, everybody. Or maybe you've had the experience where someone sold a feature that doesn't actually exist, right? The sales team is like celebrating, but you on the product team are panicking because a promise was made for a feature that doesn't work the way people thought or doesn't work at all, right? So you have to go and build something that was promised. Um, that is <laughs> not good. Right. If you've experienced something like this, you're not alone. And you might ask, like, what? How did this happen? Whose fault is this? Like, like, where did the information get disconnected? Where did it get lost? Where did it get misunderstood? And that is actually the subject of our very first poll, which I'm going to launch here. So take your time and respond to that. So this situation really reminds me of the telephone game. Um, that's what I called it. You know, where I grew up. Um, you might have called it something different, but basically it's that game where you have a bunch of people in a line or a circle and someone is whispering into somebody's ear a phrase, right? And then they whisper it into the ear of the person next to them and next to them. And you get to the end of the line and the phrase is all messed up, right? And it's a lot of fun, right? Maybe somebody misunderstood it. Maybe somebody, you know, didn't uh, catch a word and so they substituted a word or maybe somebody didn't believe it, right? And so, and so they altered it. That's a lot of fun when it's a game. It is not a lot of fun, though, if your team is playing this game throughout the product development process. And you might say, no, 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 no. This is not a problem that we have because we're, we're shipping. We're releasing new features. We've got processes, procedures. We've got industry-leading tools. There's no way that really valuable information and insights are like getting lost somewhere in here. That's just not possible. Well, it can seem like that, but actually when we add additional tools and processes and procedures, we're actually just adding more nooks and crannies here in our development process where information can be lost um, if we're not careful. So another thing that you do need to be aware of is <laughs> whoever wrote the book about scaling 
product companies had this great idea that once we get big enough, we should break the company into divisions. Okay, yeah, I get that, right? But then each division should have their own tools that are separate from each other that are administered separately and have separate access because each division should be able to make their own decisions on how they manage their information. That is the worst. And I could do a whole nother talk about that, but you're essentially creating information silos. But thank goodness we have at least one tool that we all have access to, the one source of truth within our, our organizations. No, I'm just kidding. Email is great for what email is, but it is not meant to be that thing where six months after we release a feature, we're like, oh yeah, what did we say? Um, hmm, we should go back and dig through an email. So I go back to the question, right? Whose fault is this, right? That we are losing really valuable information throughout the product development life cycle. Like who, who, <laughs> who can I point my finger to? And the question, is, the answer is, well, it's, it's kind of like nobody's fault and also everybody's fault. So let's take a look at the poll here. So I'm just going to pull this up. This is very um, <laughs> this is very telling, right? So 93% of the people on the webinar here today feel like their teams are losing information. Um, this is great, partially because that means I should go on with the webinar because y'all are identifying this is also a problem, but also this is this is not great, right? Um, we're going to look into some clear insights that you can walk away with today to help take care of this. So nobody panic. <laughs> so um, let's talk about how we can change up this telephone game, right? So that your team are not losing information. In fact, you're able to identify it, you're able to collaborate on it, and you're able to share it well with everybody so that your organization and your users can truly understand the value of your product. Now, just so you know, the first two sections we're going to cover here are a little bit theoretical, right? We're going to, you're going to university here, but hold on because the second two sections, you're going to leave with a toolbox full of actionable tools. Okay. So like, hold on with me. This isn't one of those like theoretical classes that you're going through here. You will leave with things you can do immediately. Also, I am going to throw out our next poll. So feel free to respond to that while we jump in here. So here we go. The information life cycle, I mentioned before, the information life cycle is different than the product development life cycle. They mesh up well in some places and they totally grind gears in other places. And there are spots where information will be snagged, held up, even eliminated when it really shouldn't be. So <laughs> let's talk about that. Here's a small list that I jotted down of all the places within the product development life cycle where I think information can be lost. This is not a complete list, but it is an overwhelming one. And if you are like, okay, you know, I'm in that 93% of people who think that this is a problem, how are we going to find our information? Um, we can't look at it holistically like this, right? This is just overwhelming. So here are some techniques that we can use to try to separate this out and find the information that is currently just like lost, right? So <laughs> we have to use a couple of methods here. The first one is maybe to group things by team, right? To look at each team that works throughout that product development life cycle and see um, sort of who is creating what? And sometimes this is very clear cut, right? The research group is definitely going to be creating research reports. They're going to be getting giving us, uh, you know, customer satisfaction stuff. Maybe some of that will come from marketing, but right, th this is very clear. We know that's going to come from the research team. But then what about that feature that we developed during the hackathon? Somebody from the product team and the marketing team and the support team worked on that. So who who has the documentation for that or the code? Did anybody check in the code? Probably no one checked the code into <laughs> source control, right? So it, this can be helpful with sometimes, but also it gets dodgy because there's some pieces of information that are worked on by multiple teams. So another way we could look at this is maybe we group things by the different tools that we make. So um, perhaps we say, oh, we know that the comments on the code are going to be living in our source control system, which is you know perfect, totally clear cut. But then that also... Uh, doesn't catch all the information because we can ask questions like, okay, but where does our internal documentation live? 
everywhere. It lives in all these places. Our internal documentation is spread across all of these, and that is pretty daunting to think about. But um, you know, we can't just structure things by tool because often our information, as we're creating it, spreads across these, right? So another approach we could use is we could look at the point in the product development process where information is created. And this works great for um, things like test plans, right? Those are very clearly going to be a product of the testing phase. And there's valuable information and insights in those test plans. But then there will be situations like stuff that happens outside of the product development process, like your professional services group created a, an implementation guide for setting up this new feature that you made. You didn't develop it in the product team, but your customers and your professional services team view that as part of your product and how to use your product. And so you need to account for that as part of your valuable set of information. And so this is another great way to look at it, but it's not the only way. So now I'm going to end this poll and let's take a look at y'all's thoughts here. I'm really curious. So, wow. So 40% of you are feeling like you're just losing information between teams. And I have had that feeling, especially if you're using like multiple communication tools, you know, some of you using Slack, some Teams, some email, other things, right? Just the transition of data isn't happening. 33%. Uh, yeah. So it just, it isn't making it out of a tool or a system. We'll talk a little bit about this later, but our tools are really great for part of that life cycle, that information creation life cycle. But then if we don't pull the information out into one shared place, it just kind of lives there forever. And then, yeah, 27% of people feel they're losing stuff in processes. And processes are a really um, understated issue in our companies, especially if you're a product leader, you might think, oh, well, we have a process in place. So there's no way that we're losing information. And there's no, no way that it's a nightmare to go find information later. Um, if that's you, buckle up, because that is not true. Your, <laughs> your busy worker bees might be going through, through a really rough time just doing their day jobs because information is super hard to get. All right, so let's take a look at sort of like, <laughs> what do we do next? So um, I'm just going to check to see if we have any questions here in the chat. It doesn't look like it. I mean, I'm so glad that you're hearing things now. It's nice to have you here. Um, if you do have questions, please throw them into the Q&A, y'all. I'm going to throw out another poll here, and we're going to jump into the wild and wonderful world of information anatomy. I'll be your host as we dive into this wonderful learning experience. But no, seriously, um, information has different shapes, right? And some information is more useful than others. So I'm going to talk about a couple of types of information that come out of the product development lifecycle that are really, really important, things that you should be keeping an eye out for when you're perusing through all of the places where you make stuff. Insights. These are the things that we are coming across as a product team every single day. It's those eureka moments that someone has when they're talking to a user or they're doing competitive research or they're looking through the code and they say, that's it. We could, we could change things. We could be more competitive. We could reduce costs. We could grow our user base. Whatever that is, these insights are incredibly valuable. And what we often do is we're like, yeah, let's go. And then six weeks in, we're like, why are we doing this? <laughs> What's the reason? Like, I lost it somewhere in the sea of JIRA issues. And that can happen if we lose sight of the insight that drove us in a direction. Another thing that is super easy to lose is decisions, right? Did someone just make a decision? Yes. Typically, the answer is yes. We are making decisions all the time. And in this twisting, turning product development journey, it's decisions that guide us to that final release. But they also kick off the process. They change where we're going. And these happen in the boardroom and in the break room and in a Zoom room and everywhere in between. And if we don't capture the decisions that are made, once again, we'll make it a week later and say, why are we doing this thing that we're doing? And 
God forbid you get six months from then. And someone asks, why did you build this this way? A decision was made and there was a reason. And perhaps more important than the decision itself is documenting the rationale behind the decision. The, the decision will end up being just a bullet point on a feature release, right? It'll be in your release notes. Join us next month as we talk more about awesome release notes. But the rationale for a decision, that's going to be your press release. That's going to be your webinar. That's going to be your AMA. It's the big, why did we do this thing? This is how we justify it to the board, to the users, et cetera. So that rationale is incredibly important. Also incredibly important, the feature set. I don't know if you were the one who locked it down, or maybe it was like two P, you know, two product managers ago. Someone decided these are the features that are going to be part of this release. That's all well and good, but if you didn't write it down and if you didn't make sure that everybody has access to it and knows what's in the feature, then you can't fight scope creep because there is no scope. No one knows the scope but you. So of course they're going to come in and say, "Oh, but we should add this, and we should, we should add that." Um, that that's not good, right? <laughs> um, also, along with that is the limitations. We all, you know, hopefully we do a little bit of a technical deep dive and we say, "Okay, these are very clearly the things we are not going to cover." These edge cases, right? We define those things. We write those things down. And again, we have to make sure everybody has access because otherwise you're going to have a situation where a QA engineer comes out from the darkness and says, I have you now. Here's a use case you didn't cover. I'm going to submit a JIRA bug back into the darkness. Now, of course, I love QA engineers and I love the work they do, but this sort of thing happens when people don't know the limitations that we've clearly called out because they think there's a bug. They think we forgot something and we didn't. We decided not to do that thing. What's worse is after we've released things, if we don't clearly document this for our users, our users will also think we have bugs, missing features. They'll submit things. They'll ask for things, not realizing that we intentionally left that use case out, that edge case for a reason. All right, let's jump into value. And let's talk a little bit about short-term information versus long-term information. Because as I mentioned, we are creating a lot of information in our tools, and that's useful for a time, but not forever. So feature development is very cyclical, right? We're creating a lot of information. We get the release out the door, and maybe we sweep the floor a little bit before we start developing something new. It's just the product development process and it's great and flawed and beautiful and awful. As we start working on the next thing, we often ignore that pile of information that we have left behind in all of our tools in Slack, wherever, <laughs> wherever that was eventually dumped. And the good news is we don't need all of that information, um, not all the time. So here's what we need to focus on. Some information is totally valuable just in the short term. Things like UI mockups, tech specs, test plans, PR comments, et cetera. These are those things that we are creating typically within different tools. And very quickly, very rapidly, we love collaboration tools here at K15T. And I know your teams do as well because we can just build information and change it really quickly. And we have these specialized tools to help us make these kinds of information. That's really awesome, as long as everybody has access to those tools. Um, it's okay for it to be scattered. It's okay for it to be messy, as long as it's connected at some in some ways and people can get to it. But now, out of that whole like frenzy of creating information, comes the pieces of information that we need to draw out because they have long-term value. Things like, <laughs> straight up, what does the actual UI say? Um, yes, that is information. Also, the product documentation, the decisions that we made. Yes, someone will ask us six months from now or six years from now. We need to have that. What are the feature sets and the limitations? Those are the things that we need to go into all those tools, find those pieces of information, and pull them out. Those are the true gold nuggets long term. So I'm going to close the poll here, and let's take a look at this together. So... Um, Interesting. Wow, we have a, a almost an even split. 
59% of you think that your team is good at documenting long-term information. That is a good number. That kind of like made my day. Um, the 41%, hold on, I'm, I'm with you there. Documenting long-term information is a very hard thing to do for various reasons. Um, in another life, I was a tech writer and it's not a, <laughs> not a job that a lot of people want to do because that act of pulling stuff out and making sure that it's digestible and usable for everyone is hard to do. But I am really encouraged to see almost 60% of you saying that your teams are already pretty good at this. That's great because once you've found your information, you can get it to those people that document it so well. <laughs> All right. So I am going to jump into one quick review of the information life cycle. I've talked about this just a little bit, but I'm such an information nerd. I have to touch on it for just a minute. So there's the product development life cycle. I had it on screen earlier. Um, I'm not going to try to re recite all the steps because it's kind of different for every team. That is separate from the information life cycle. And I just want to highlight that because it's super important that we know where things start to go wrong. So the first stage of information development is creation, right? Just writing the content. And this is typically really fun because we have all these great tools that allow us to create information really easily. We can add emoji. It's fun. Then comes the collaboration phase, which is also really fun because we're using those collaborative tools, jumping in, changing things, coming up with things, making crucial, crucial decisions that we need to document. Those fit really well with the product development life cycle. The gears start to jam a little when it comes to updating information because you're in that Zoom meeting, you're in the coffee room and you're like, oh yeah, um, we did make a decision and I should go into some tool and update that thing, but I don't really want to because it takes some time and I don't, you know, I need to go write code or whatever the case may be, right? You start to see the product development life cycle starting to jam up against the information life cycle. Things start to get real, real dodgy <laughs> when it comes to long-term documentation and maintenance, at least for 41% of us, because the team is trying to continue that momentum to get, you know, to ship the code, to get the marketing campaigns out there, to get the information to sales, whatever the case may be. And you have to stop and draw the information out and make sure it's making it to that long-term documentation world. And that's really hard to do uh, because teams don't want to stop. Um, Paul, you, you should be able to, there should be a Q&A button in Zoom that should open up the Q&A window. I hope that's working for you. Um, let us know. Um, and then the final stage, which is just where the wheels come off typically, is deletion and archival. All the rest of that information that is not valuable long-term, you got to do away with it. And we'll talk about that a little bit more, but you can see how these two life cycles don't necessarily want to live together. It's our job as knowledge and information sharers to make that happen. And let's get into that because now we have some practical things to talk about. I'm gonna launch our next poll here. Y'all can jump into that when you feel you'd like to. And let's talk about finding information problems. At last, let's dig into this. How can we identify the information that we might be losing by looking at the sort of things that we do every day? And the first thing we can do is to start counting things. So with this method, what we do is we count the tools and steps and places that people on our product teams have to go through to access um, information and to the complete and action needed. So to do this, a really simple thing you could do is say, hey, hey team, I need this piece of information that is related to, I don't know, a feature that we released six months ago. I keep using six months because that like in the product development world, that's just like an eternity, right? So if we can remember stuff six months ago, we good. <laughs> so go and find me this piece of information about something we released six months ago and then count every step, tool, process, et cetera, that someone has to go through every touch point to get an answer for you, to get that information. And then ask questions like, who did they need to ask? What tools did they need to reference? What IDs did they need to look up to find the thing? Um, what else did they need to ask? 
Uh, who else did they need to ask? Was there a back and forth between two people or two tools or multiple tools? How many times did they go back and forth? Was there a delay, like a point in that process where they literally just had to wait for a person or a tool um, and just like, you know, I don't know, do something else. And then did they have to update the information before they got it to you? Because when they found it, they found that it was out of date. These sorts of questions really clearly can tell us, okay, we have a problem here, or maybe we don't. Again, if you're a leader here, um, you may be surprised and pleased to find that, yes, in fact, our process is really efficient and our tools are working really well and our team can very quickly get to stuff. Um, but also you might be sort of shocked by what people have to go through to do what might seem like a simple task. Um, and in a time where we are absolutely trying to retain the best talent, we do not want to be aggravating people by making finding just like the simple task of finding information so aggravating that they're like, maybe there's a better way somewhere else. So another approach we could take here is to look for instances where the team is feeling pain, but not necessarily knowing that this is an information problem. And you're probably seeing these every day. And speaking of, Paul, I see your question. I will get to that in just a minute. It's a good one. So let's look, uh, the, the way that you do this is look for expressions of pain that the team is feeling um, every day. So this would be things like you're in a stand-up meeting and someone says, we missed something in the, in the build again, right? Or I have been spending hours of time on support cases for the feature that we released two weeks ago, or the sales team keeps bugging me for information about that product or that feature that we released two months ago. These might just feel to the team like these are just normal team annoyances, you know, trials and tribulations that the product development process gives us. But no, these are all, in fact, information issues. And if you find any of these points of pain, they are clear signals to you that, hey, okay, we need to dig in and figure out what information is missing that's making the sales team continue to ask for that information or is making our customers reach out to support, right? Those are clear indicators. We just have to recognize this is an information problem. It's not just an everyday ache and pain that the team is feeling. Another really effective approach that we can use, and this is something that some of us are going to celebrate, is stop answering email. I, you know, kind, kind of. So <laughs> the, the number of email or other messages that especially product managers get in a day is just like wild. And you have to, you know, you have become the source of clarity. You are the source of truth and people come to you to, you know, answer questions. Why was this done? What are the decisions? What does this do? Um, you, be, you become the tester, you become the engineer. It's, it's, it's wild. And then you have to write these personalized messages in response to all of these questions. I am suggesting don't. What you should do instead is respond with links to the information that's out there in whatever tools, you know, wherever they are, send links. Hmm, interesting. Before I tell you more, let's look at our poll results here. So how many questions a week do you answer? All right, so 65%, we're hovering in that zero to four area. That's excellent. Um, there's 6% of you here. Um, that I wish I could send you some chocolates and maybe a hug, if you're a hugger, of course. Um, yeah, 10 plus, that's rough. Um, the five to nine area, also rough. What's really rough is like, how long does it take to write an email? I don't know, you know, maybe it's a, maybe it's a two minute response, but how much effort do you put in to, to, to like figure out what does the thing do? Do you have to open up your app and do a little testing and figuring out like, what is that edge case they're asking about? And that, you know, like maybe then you also create a JIRA ticket because you realize like there is a bug or maybe it's just missing from the documentation, right? This can represent hours of time. I just got back from a product management conference where like during most talks, I saw the product managers in the audience um, <laughs> typing emails. Almost everybody had an inbox up where they're typing responses to people. This represents a huge loss of time for the team and a potential source of misinformation because you should not have to go back and try to figure out like, what did we do? It should be written somewhere, hopefully. All right. So, um, 
we talked a little bit about um, not just responding to emails. So what you can do instead is send links to the information that you know exists out there and then ask certain questions about what happens there. Like, for example, why did they ask you in the first place? You know, why didn't this person find this information? Did they have access to it? Um, did the link or links that I sent them, did that answer their question? Were you able to quickly search for it and find it? Was all the information that you needed in a single place or was it scattered across multiple places? Was it inaccurate when you found it? Um, do the people that ask the question of you, do they not trust the source of information? There's a lot of questions you can ask here, but any one of these points to, okay, we're losing stuff. Let's fix things. Speaking of fixing things, we're going to talk about that in a minute. But first of all, I have a question here from Paul. So do we need information stewards whose role it is to monitor our information systems and content? Oh, Paul, that's such a good question. Um, I work at a company where we are all information stewards, um, which is a pretty unique and incredible thing. I've had the luck of working at two places now where this is part of our, our culture, where um, the accuracy of information, because we know everybody depends on it, we have a very high um, value on maintaining that information. But that doesn't mean that's going to be a culture everywhere. And certainly, we, you know, um, we have different instances, different projects and situations where someone is clearly sort of the keeper of of, of the information. So yeah, I, I would say like if you're kicking off a, pro a project or you're kicking off a new feature, um, kind of figure out who on the team is going to, to be that person to, to make sure. Often like if it's a project, that's a lot of the times it's gonna be your project manager. If you're working in a product team, maybe that's the person filling the role as your scrum master. Um, I've been a scrum master before and I filled that role. Um, that's <laughs> that's what got me into tech writing because I was doing so well at uh, you know keeping hold of our information. It was like, oh, let's work on the external stuff too. Um, maybe that's your product manager, but honestly, we throw too much on the product manager. Um, it could also be one of your engineers. Some engineers are like, no, please, I will, you know, you can ask me questions and, but I don't want to write the stuff down. Um, you know, but some engineers are like, yeah, I, I'm a details person. I want to make sure that, um, things are valuable. One of the things that is really important to remember as a product team is why do we do this? Right. And, um, you know, especially for those people that are pressed for time, the best justification I've ever heard is, OK, you can skip writing this down now or you cannot document this decision. But are you willing to do this six months from now where you have to go into the code that you wrote or into the old Confluence page you created and try to discern what the decision was or how this works or whatever the case may be? Um, generally, people will realize like, oh, <laughs> oh, no. I don't want to have to do this in six months, so let's do it now. So whatever works for your culture, but there's uh, the the true like core of it is having people understand how important information is, right? It, it's like we would never ship our product without some of the UI, right? Like, oh, <laughs> we released it, but that screen, I don't know. I don't know where that went. Do you know where that went? Or like, oh, you know, here's the marketing campaign, but we completely forgot the webinar. What happened to that webinar, right? the information has to be in place for that long-term life of the product as well, right? Um, it's it's almost, uh, you know, it's, it's very troubling if the team doesn't see the value of that as well. So there's so much to this answer. Uh, as you can tell, I'm having trouble answering it. But um, yeah, a lot to think about. I'm going to launch another poll here. It's our last poll, which is kind of bumming me out. Um, and I do see another question from you, Paul. I'll get to that in a minute because we're going to talk a little bit about fixing stuff, which is what we're all here to do, right? There are a lot of things that we can do to fix this problem. I've just tried to jabber on about that answering Paul's question, but here's a couple of like really clear cut things that I know that everybody would benefit from. And the first one is opening access to your information. Okay. And mostly that means systems. It is crucial that as many people as possible have access to the tools and the places where you 
create your information. No, I'm not talking about the company financials or the HR records. I'm talking about all the SharePoints and all the Asana projects and all the Trello boards and, and you know, whatever. Make sure that everybody has read access, please. And maybe you're like, you know, dollar bill signs like, oh no, it would cost way too much to give everybody access. I get it. But you, the, the value of everyone having the information they need, not having to ask another person, it is just like demonstrably greater than the cost of those licenses. Um, there are so many reasons why, um, starting with the fact that you don't want people to, to be frustrated trying to find information. There are so many crazy stats on how much time we spend doing that throughout our work week. Um, and then also I would say, if at all possible, give people edit access to information. Again, you might be like, oh, that's gonna cost more. It's worth it. Um, some might say, oh, no, 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 no. People are gonna break our information. They'll, they'll, they'll wreck it if they have edit access. I assure you that is not the case. Right. I, I I have worked in jobs where I'll find a piece of information, and say, oh, that's not right. Right. We made a decision. We changed our minds, whatever. I'm just going to change. Oh, no, there's no edit access. It says I need to ask the system admin for access here or I have to send a, a support ticket to this person. Like, no, I don't have time for that. And immediately that information becomes stale. It's no longer valuable. And by not giving people edit access, or at least really, really quick access to the person who has edit access, we run the risk of making that information not only just useless, but potentially damaging because it's inaccurate. So it could, it could mislead someone in the future. Another thing is, and I will say this until I'm blue in the face, copy and paste has brought down empires. Copy and paste can be the worst thing for our product information and Here's why. The information that we create day to day is typically static, which is like test plans, user stories, documentation, marketing copy. Um, if I update the documentation, it doesn't update the marketing content. They're, they're, they're disconnected. They are static. And that's good um, for the most part until it's not good. So one piece of static information is easily copied using our tools, but that can have devastating effects if one thing is updated and it's expected that the other will be. So a great example is maybe you have a tool like Jira where you're like, as the product manager, you're like, this is the source of truth. And um, you know, here's the status of how we're doing with our feature development. So the status, you know, everybody's gonna go to Jira and see that, except what you don't realize is someone is copying that status and putting it on their weekly report that they're emailing to uh, the C-level. And, and all of a sudden there's questions on why those two things don't match up. And that's because of static information. Because someone copied something and didn't realize that the other was being updated. We, <laughs> it's the Achilles heel. We get ourselves all the time with this. So what we need to do is try to develop our information dynamically. And that sounds super fancy, but actually we've been doing this for a while. So one way to do this is to use links. It's the OG way to have dynamic information, which is to just say, hey, if you want to see the status, click this link and go to Jira and see the status, right? See it right there. But that's not fun. I mean, it's 2023. We want to see the status right there in that window or page or whatever that we're looking at. So that would be uh, where we create a dynamic connection. And most of the tools we use do this. This is like when you paste a link into Slack and then Slack shows like a portion of that thing, you know, a portion of the text right there in Slack. It's really, really cool. And what's actually happening is it's taking the source of truth and putting it right there in front of the person in whatever context they're in. They don't know this is happening, but that way everybody has the right information. And that's like, if you're using Confluence, you'll use um, content reuse macros. If you're using Google Docs, you're going to use smart chips. Um, I think those are out by now. I hope they are. They said spring of 2023. In Word, you're going to use reuse files. Almost every tool has a way to do this. And the difference is drastic. And then also... There may be situations where just a straight up database is great. If you have the kind of information that's um, very similar, right? Just create a database of that so that people, you know, you can reference the database and share a piece of that. Um, 
And some of the tools we're using are already databases, right? Jira and Asana. And then others like Notion and Confluence are really complemented well by databases. Um, Confluence does not have databases currently, but I happen to know a company that makes an app that adds them and they are exceptional and you'll never be able to use Confluence without them. Finally, this might be really scary to you. It's <laughs> I talked to so many people on product teams about this, but we need to clear out the trash. Okay. I'm going to pull up our poll here so that we can look at this together. Um, does your team delete outdated information when you find it? Wow, 60%. We're looking at the same 60%. 60% of the, the, the people here today, y'all are on great teams. This is really exciting. 40% um, of us are like, mm, no, we're not so great about it. Maybe there's this like internal fear of like, what happens if we lose valuable information? Um, <laughs> I've heard that so many times. Like, what if I need it, right? What if I need it later? Um, totally a legitimate argument, but chances are you're, you're not going to need it later. <laughs> um, and, you know, that is a big struggle that a lot of us have. It can go against everything that you're feeling, but you need to delete stuff. I'm not just talking about writing outdated in the title or, you know, crossing out the text. I mean, literally delete the stuff because it is ruining our team's day-to-day -day work. It is cluttering up search results with a bunch of versions of a page and you're like, okay, which is the actual one? It is ruining, you know, like even we're looking at AI now as the future. AI can't look, you know, AI can't understand of those five copies of this information, which is the right one. It's just going to spit out a, a conglomeration of all of them, which will be very intelligent and cool looking, but very, very wrong. So a couple of ways that we can do this and just sort of make this habitual is to group information at the beginning um, of our product development process. And this is great if we have, you know, if we have seasonal releases, especially. So maybe you make a whole, um, <laughs> Paul, maybe I am the Marie Kondo of information hoarding um, sometimes, but also um, I heard that Marie has like stepped back She's ha she has three kids now. That third kid like sent her over the edge and she's like, ah, my life can be a little messy, which like if you've ever seen my personal confluence space, you'll be like, why did I go to his webinar? <laughs> so like, yeah, um, <laughs> do what I say, not what I do in my personal confluence space. It's a mess. Um, <laughs> so um, yeah, so deletion. Um, group your product information based on your seasonal release, if you can. So maybe that looks like, hey, at the beginning of our seasonal release, we create a new SharePoint folder. Don't create a new SharePoint site. I'm begging you. There should just be one for the entire organization. Write that down, please. Create a new folder. Put all of your meeting notes in there. Put all of your uh, test plans and all of that information that you know will only be valuable short term. I'm sure you QA people are like, no, my test plans are, are valuable long term. Some of them are another talk for another time, friends. So group it all there, release the thing, and then archive that folder. And then a year later, come and delete it because chances are nobody even looked at the archive. Okay, just delete it. Um, that will clear up your search results. Another thing you can do is leverage those dynamic connections that you already created, right? So uh, we talked about linking things. So if you're looking at a page that's out of date and it links to another page, go to that page and delete that too, or at least delete the section or update the section. Make sure that you're not leaving old connections to out of date information. And I mentioned the whole grouping inf of information, but that might not work if you're in a constantly release ready state. So just build cleanups into your regular product development process. Because as I mentioned, near the end of that information life cycle, that's where things start to jam up because the team is prioritizing the time for that long-term documentation and cleanup effort. So you have to build it into your process. So if you're doing seasonal releases, use your hardening sprint, right? You should be improving the quality of your code during your hardening sprint. And you should also be improving the quality of your information. If you're in a continuous release uh, process, just make it a working meeting that you do every week or every other week. Maybe you spend 15 minutes, maybe it's, you know, 50 minutes, clean stuff up, 
It could even be, you know, if you have a larger cleanup to do, maybe you use some time during the next hackathon and clean up a spot, build trust in the information you have for that long-term value. So on to Paul's question. Paul asked, what do you think about internal information needing to be recast or reframed from consumption by others outside the group that created the information? Context is key to ensure the information can actually be understood. That is so interesting, Paul. Yeah, so I could jump into one of the spaces for one of our product teams and I can start reading through you know, the, the technical um, diagrams that are there. But if I don't understand what the feature is, why we're building it, and I can't like start from the point that I'm at entering their space and entering that page, it's not valuable to me. Um, it's a good it's a good question. Um, really, part of this journey of enter, you know, um, recognizing valuable information and making it useful for others is is understanding not everybody needs to know everything all the time. In fact, we don't want that. That's why we invented search engines, right? It's really about, okay, when I need to learn the thing, can I type it into the search box and find the thing I need using the words that I'm using? So it, it really, the team has to think about that a little bit. Like, okay, do we need to write a whole introduction that's attached to this technical specification um, that most likely non-technical people will never see? No, maybe not. But even the engineer a year from now who is updating that feature, they will need some manner of context there. So there needs to be a description or a link to a page with the description. Um, you have to, well, I, I always steal this quote from a former colleague, Ted Husted, who's just an uh, amazing thinker and just a brilliant engineer. But he always said, we need to be kinder to our future selves. So always think about you and your position. What would I need six months from now? And also, you know, your external users, if you're making this information public or you're thinking about it, think about what will they need in the future? When we release this feature and they have a question, what will they need to know? Um, that is the the really important thing. It's, it's, it's a very empathetic thing that we have to do. Think about all of your user personas. Think about all of your internal customers, all the people who might look for that information. Can they find it? Um, these are the sorts of things that, um, you know, marketing folks are really good at, right? Because Google is looking for meaning, not just keywords now. And so really improving content to match that. Um, all of our internal information will benefit from that as well so that our really valuable information doesn't just like drop into a hole in a SharePoint site somewhere and we never see it again. So, wow, great question, Paul. Probably I could talk more about it, but I don't know if I can give you a more solid answer. So, wow, we have talked about where information lives <laughs> so that we can like catch that valuable product information. And, you know, uh, based on, <laughs> based on the stats, um, you know, it seems like a lot of us really need that a little bit more. Um, we also know how to recognize valuable information, how it can look uh, so that we can capture it as it's growing and changing and, you know, and document it long-term. Potentially. And it's exciting to see that 60 ish percent of our teams are actually, you know, doing that successfully today. Um, we also know how to like really fairly quickly identify information problems that we might be seeing um, and surface that valuable content, kind of like get into the guts of things. Also, like, God bless you, those people that are answering 10 plus emails. I hope that you can reduce that with some of the tricks that we talked about here today. And then finally, we talked about like, uh, changing up our tools, techniques, and processes so that we can make sure that valuable content is where it needs to be for the short term and the long term. And again, 60% of teams, it seems like you're kind of rocking at this and that is excellent. And you know, the, the rest of us in that 40%, we got this, right? We can instill that value of knowledge sharing and information in our team because the benefits that our users will reap and our organization will really will reap are just like so, so massive. And we do all of this so we can take that priceless information that we're already making like every day in the product development process so we can build better products, make our users more successful, scale our user base, you know, exponentially, and most importantly, communicate the value of our product, which is so, so exciting. So speaking of exciting, 
Do you have any questions? We have a few minutes. I'm here. I got a coffee. I hope you do also. Um, throw them in Q&A, or if you have any that you want to just drop in the chat. Um, this has been fascinating. I love the polls. I love hearing from all of you, sort of like what your teams are currently experiencing. Um, I've talked about this at a few different conferences now. And one question that came up that really kind of got me <laughs> in the heart because I've dealt with this before. Someone asked, um, what do you do if information, you know, it's so messed up? What do you like? Where do you start? And that's a good question. And really, you have to start at a place of trust. You have to talk to the people on your team, or maybe it's even your users, right? Maybe there's tr trust issues with your documentation. And so you have to say, do you trust this source? If I say go to help.k15t.com, do you do you feel like you trust this or is there not trust there anymore? Um, or go to this SharePoint site, go to this Trello board. If people don't trust it, then that's an issue, right? That might be the situation where you need to say, okay, I'm creating a new Confluence space. I'm going to migrate over the reliable information um, or you know whatever, whatever tool that you're talking about. If there is still trust, and that happens, right? People are like, yeah, I, I do believe this is the right place. It just, it's out of date. That might be the situation where you're like, okay, cool. So um, <laughs> help me maybe identify where this needs to be updated. You probably need to do an audit. Woo, super fun. And then, as I mentioned, maybe take some hackathon time, or if you have 10% time, if that's a thing that your organization does, clean that up like work with your knowledge uh, stakeholders, try to clean that up. And again, always use that justification of if we get this right and clean this up, then you won't have to answer questions about it later. <laughs> Works like a charm. Um, Paul asked, are there figures about the return on investment uh, for good information processes and hygiene? Oh, that's such a good question, Paul. I really struggle with this. And actually I am... Um, I read through a really long study that was ordered by the STC, which is the Society for Technical Communicators here in the US. Um, and they did a big study on sort of like um, very strictly like technical communicators or tech writers as a profession. And it, it really laid out like that role seems to be sort of disappearing or changing because organizations struggle to see the value they add. Or leaders are like, well, I have a marketer who writes information, so why would I also have a person on the team who is writing information? And at K15T, we kind of agree with that sentiment because we see like everybody on the team is creating information all the time. So not necessarily say like, oh, I don't have to, just one person does. But the trick is information is such a common thread through everything we do, it is very difficult. To, to lock down the true value it gives. Some of the key metrics that I always point to are look at, um, and your, your support team should be tracking this. If not, they probably can add a flag pretty easily. Look at the number of support cases that are resolved by sharing a link to external documentation. That's a really big one because as we grow our user base, we also, um, <sighs> It's not a direct connection, right? Because we can automate some things, but to some degree, as the user base grows, the number of customer support associates also has to grow. And that is you know, kind of painful for the company because you're talking another salary, et cetera, et cetera. If you can demonstrate that having great external content is reducing the hiring rate of customer support people because you're deflecting more support cases or you're resolving them more quickly, that's money. Right, <laughs> because everybody's looking to provide great support, hopefully, but also like reduce support costs. Um, and you know, also it's great for the support team to feel like they have the information to support them. So that's a really, a really huge one. Uh, another great ROI opportunity is if you can work with um, your marketing team and your sales team. These are teams that are putting out a lot of information anyway to see how you can, you know, leverage that information that you've maintained well. How is that helping them deliver better campaigns, better sales, um, driving our user growth? 
if you can connect to marketing and sales, the big budget teams, that's also a success. Um, but like straight up, information is a is a core part of everything we do. Um, but yet it's a thing that we forget, right? We're looking for higher quality code or higher quality people, but we let our information languish. Um, those are some of the key metrics I can point to, but there's probably other ones out there. I'd love to know, you know, other people's thoughts. And thank you for pointing that out, Shannon. We did um we did create a very interesting article. Um, kind of based on what we talked about here today, that might be great for those people that are, you know, want to read this as opposed to listen to it. Um, we're super passionate about this, if you can't tell, it, like so, so excited about this. Um, so if you have more questions, you can send them to me. I'm just mad at K15T, or you can send them to help at k 15 Well, no, I guess help at K15T is if you have problems with our products, but um, Christian uh, asked, Kind of the opposite extreme of having every everything in a single place. Um, multiple resources are not necessarily a bad thing as long as the target audience is well defined. Even in product development, dev team doc, uh, yeah, dev team docs, even supporting the feature, um, a feature A, it may live outside the actual user docs. Yeah, yeah, Christian, that that's a really good point. I'm not saying there should be one tool that has all the things. As I mentioned, like in the product development lifecycle, especially, we have great tools that are very purpose built for, for specific things. And that's good. Um, that kind of the tricky part, yeah, is figuring out where does it live long term? We all know that stuff gets lost forever in Slack. It's because Slack is just not meant to be that. It's the same with email, right? It's not meant to be that long term place. Um, but we just kind of all think of like, well, this is it. This is all I have. So I got to dig through email to try to find it, right? Um, framing that plan, it's kind of like thinking about product features. It's like, okay, in the end state, what is, you know, what are the modules in my product or, or however you think about the feature sets and how the feature sets map together? This, you do the same thing with information. Well, this is product documentation. This is internal support articles. This is, um, you know, education on our university portal. You have to be strategic about these things. Um, and, and that's how you take that gold information and actually get it to people, even if it's people internally. That's so good. Yeah, context is super important, uh, Christian. And don't go to one tool. There's no one tool that will serve all of our needs. But, you know, Find a tool and then make sure people know where it is and how to use it and when to use it and make sure they have access. I'm telling you and edit access, please. All right, my friends, our time here is almost up, which is my least favorite thing to say on a webinar. Um, this has been a pleasure. As you can tell, I love doing this. I love sharing what we're learning. I hope you share back with us what you're learning. Um, a couple of things. If you're interested in these sort of like bigger questions and larger stories, so are we. We we are going to be looking at a lot of stuff like this over the next year. Next month, we're going to look into the importance of release notes and, and like what release notes really represent. Um, they are not just a bug log that nobody reads. Um, we're using them internally in our company ex as well as externally. They're pretty cool. They're pretty cool. I'm actually set to interview a bunch of people internally tomorrow about that. We're going to tell a whole big story. So if you would like to join us in that conversation, I would recommend please, um, please sign up for our newsletter. We don't spam here. Um, I promise. I used to be a user of ours. Um, we will send what we're learning as we're learning it. We'll send up a bunch of stuff in the coming month all about that. Um, as we're, you know, getting everybody's thoughts together. So please sign up for our, our newsletter if you're interested in joining us on this information journey. And then also we're going to be throwing a survey in the uh, in the chat so that you can sort of let us know what you thought of this content. Please, I'm begging you. We don't want to operate in a vacuum. We are here to share our knowledge and uh, information to make the world a better place. So let us know if we're doing that. Thank you for throwing that in the chat, Stefan. Otherwise, this has been an absolute pleasure um, at K15T. We are super passionate about helping all teams share your information and knowledge with the world and, of course, enabling you to do what you do best. So have a great one, everybody.